Imagine this, a volcano literally erupts right outside your house. I mean, it sounds insane, right? But that's exactly what happened back in 1973 on this small Icelandic island called Heimae. And get this, people there started dumping tons of salt water onto the lava just to save their town. Sounds ridiculous, but it actually worked. It's a bit crazy, like something out of a sci-fi movie or even your imagination, but it's real. Now, they didn't exactly dump water straight into the volcano, but what they did do? It's wild. Let's get into it. So how does it all kick off? At around 8 p.m. on January 21st, 1973, a bunch of small earthquakes start shaking near Hema'e. They're too weak for anyone on the island to actually feel, but over on the mainland, which is about 60 kilometers away, a seismic station picks up more than 100 strong tremors between 1 and 3 a.m. on the 22nd. These tremors, it seemed, were coming from just south of the island. The shaking continued a bit more slowly until 11 a.m. when it just stopped. However, it restarted at 11 p.m. Between then and 1.34 a.m. on January 23rd, seven stronger quakes were recorded, and unfortunately, they kept moving closer to the town. Now, here's the thing. Small tremors like these are common in places like Iceland. After all, the country sits directly on top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is where the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates pull apart. That makes Iceland one of the most volcanically active places on Earth, with a minor eruption every four to five years. So the citizens weren't concerned very much about the events that were taking place. That's why what happened next was pretty alarming. At about 1.55 a.m. on January 23rd, a long crack suddenly opened in eastern Hema'e. It was super close, about 200 meters east of the nearest village center, and it was extremely loud. The whole situation caught residents completely off guard. The lava appeared, spouting lava fountains that likely went higher than the local church steeple. The eruption grew so close that people could see it from their windows. The crack quickly grew from 300 meters to 2 kilometers, cutting all the way across the island from shore to shore. In just a few hours, some parts of the town were already threatened by advancing lava and falling ash. And the air? Well, it was extremely lethal. Imagine a dark plume that's carrying ash and gases drifting over an area. Seems ominous, doesn't it? In addition to that, it also posed some serious health risks. Eldfels is erupting, and the people on Hema, eh? They don't really know what to do. An evacuation had to take place to protect what little remained of their homes. Some residents took quick, resourceful action. Windows that faced the volcano were covered with sheets of corrugated iron, kind of like a DIY shield. Just something to keep their homes sort of safe from the insane heat, flying debris, and the constant ash falling from the sky. It wasn't much, but it was their way of pushing back, even if just a little. A way of saying, we're not giving up yet. Meanwhile, the eruption, still going. It went on with something called Strombolian-style activity. That's explosive bursts of lava and gas. You might be a bit shocked to know that these eruptions continued until February 19th. Additionally, the eruption column went so high that it went up to 9,000 meters. Basically, it went insanely high. Now, the volcano keeps erupting, and lava starts flowing toward the north and east. But here's the weird part. Unlike most basalt lava that usually runs pretty fast, this stuff is way thicker and way stickier than you'd expect. Therefore, it didn't splatter much. Instead, it threw out heavy chunks of volcanic rock that sometimes exploded mid-air or shattered if it hit the ground. I definitely won't want to be anywhere near that lava. The residents of Hema'e needed to move fast. The evacuation was urgent. Lava was already moving into the eastern side of town, and the entire island faced the threat of heavy ashfall. I think it's truly remarkable how a stroke of luck sped up the evacuation process. Just a few days earlier, some heavy storms had rolled in. As luck would have it, the entire fishing fleet is already docked in the harbor. That ends up being a lifesaver. Why? 
Well, now evacuation by sea becomes the fastest and safest way out. The first boats left for the mainland around 2.30 a.m., less than an hour after the eruption began. Now, while most of the 5,300 residents escaped by boat, a few got taken away by air. Thankfully, the island's airstrip hadn't been touched by lava. Planes quickly left Reykjavik and Keflavik, and this allowed the elderly and hospital patients to be airlifted to safety. Just six hours later, nearly the entire population had reached the mainland. Only a handful of people stayed behind to carry out critical duties and recover belongings from homes at risk. We have to realize that this wasn't just an ordinary volcanic event, and it soon revealed alarming features that made the situation far more dangerous. You should know that the lava moved steadily, basically about 40 meters per hour. Moreover, lava temperatures reached extreme highs of up to 1100 degrees Celsius. That's really hot. As the hours passed, the eruption didn't remain stationary. Instead, it continued to shift closer to town, extending roughly 50 meters westward every hour on January 23rd. Although the movement was gradual, it created constant uncertainty for emergency crews and increased the risk for residents who had not yet evacuated. The plume in the sky sometimes rained hot debris and ash onto the land. That made the evacuation efforts a little bit more complicated. Fortunately, most of the inhabitants were already safe and that was a huge relief. Volcanologists monitored the eruption closely, especially considering its atypical behavior, which was all over the place. Nothing about it was steady or easy to read. So the lava kept moving, but there was something else. The Vestmana Ayar Harbor, also known as the Hema A Harbor, stood in the direct path of the volcano's destruction. While the eruption had already swallowed hundreds of homes and blanketed much of the island in ash, the most urgent danger loomed just ahead, which was the harbor. Now, the harbor wasn't just a docking point, it was the economic heart of Hemae and, by extension, a vital artery for all of Iceland. At this time, this small island's fishing industry contributed roughly 3% to the national GDP. Quite an extraordinary figure for such a tiny population. Boats from Hema'e hauled in massive catches, and that's something that heavily supported the land's thriving processing industry, as well as helping to feed an entire nation. It was absolutely certain that if the lava closed off the harbor entrance, Hema'e's economy would be ruined, and Iceland as a whole would get affected too. You could be thinking that some other people had fought against lava before. Well, indeed, people had tried to stop lava in the past, but their efforts weren't so successful. In 1935, the U.S. Army dropped bombs on Mauna Loa's lava tubes in an attempt to divert lava. Historians still debate whether it had any real effect. In 1960, Hawaiians used bulldozers and water to hold back lava. That didn't work out well. So it leaves us asking, what exactly do you do when a wall of lava threatens everything you love? It seems to me that you turn the ocean against it. The situation was very dire, and molten rock kept moving to the harbor at the speed of a walking man. It seemed Hema'e's last hope was, well, drowning the lava with the ocean. Scientists proposed this radical idea, and although no one had ever tried this on such a scale before, they had no choice. Now, there was little time to think of whether the plan would work or not. Once the lava sealed that channel, no force on Earth could reopen it. And there was yet another thing. The scientists watching the lava saw one thing. It wasn't letting up. If anything, it just kept pushing harder, almost like pressure building up with nowhere to go. Then came a break. On the fifth day, the lava's behavior shifted. Its surface crust thickened. Its advance slowed, not enough to stop the threat, but enough to give the people an opening. With lava getting closer to Hema'e's harbor, crews had to move fast. At first, they used a bulldozer to lay seawater pipes across the cooling lava. The crust was still firm enough back then to hold the weight, but as things went on, the lava started piling into steep walls, too high and shaky for the bulldozer to keep going. After that, workers had to step in, dragging the pipes by hand across hot, uneven ground. It was intense. 
to stop the lava, authorities coordinated a massive operation. 32 high-capacity pumps got flown in from the USA. These pumps worked around the clock, running continuously for 15 days straight in the initial stage, with each shift involving intense coordination and danger. Communication teams also used radios to relay changes in lava movement, allowing workers to adjust spray angles in real time. Of course, when you're working so closely with lava, burns are a major work hazard, so operators had to wear wet clothing to prevent burns. Besides the risk of bodily harm, it's crazy to say that the entire system used up to 20 megawatts of electricity. That's about the same amount used by an entire small town. Besides, the system required backup diesel generators and constant fuel supplies. It made the effort as logistically demanding as it was dangerous. Crews operated in extreme conditions. The air radiated heat intense enough to melt boot soles and ignite tractor tires. Seems like workers suffered third-degree burns as well. They came from sudden bursts of steam, and many of them improvised with heat shields that they made from scrap metal. The water pipes remained intact thanks to the cooling seawater that ran. However, their metal support shafts weren't so lucky. But the system slowly came together. The moment seawater hit the edge of the lava, huge clouds of steam exploded into the air. It was a wild sight, loud, hot, and non-stop. The teams had to step back a bit because it was quite a force. It might have looked chaotic, but the plan was actually working. As seawater hit the lava, the outer layer started turning into thick black crust. Bit by bit, each splash helped slow it down. It wasn't perfect, but it gave them more time. At its peak, the system of pipes stretched really far, and the cooling operation used an estimated 6 to 7 million cubic meters of seawater. After roughly 160 days of continuous effort, the lava front finally stopped. A shocking 50 meters short of sealing off the harbor. Way too close, if you ask me. Despite the destruction of about 400 buildings, the harbor was saved. There was only one casualty during the entire eruption, and that's probably from gas inhalation. But considering the circumstances, the island of Hema'e certainly came out stronger. When the lava finally reached the ocean, it started building up near the harbor's entrance. Over time, it formed a kind of natural wall in the water, a breakwater. Before that, boats had a hard time with the tides, but now, the water inside the harbor was way calmer, and the boats were floating just fine. Later, dredging revealed another benefit. The eruption had deepened parts of the harbor. Larger ships could now dock more easily than before. For Hema'e's fishermen, the transformation was hard to believe. Many had left the island in despair, convinced their livelihoods were gone. Yet when they returned, they found a port that was not only intact, but improved. Although lava and ash had buried nearly 400 buildings and swallowed streets and landmarks, the island's economic lifeline had not only been saved, it had been enhanced. As a result, locals weren't the only ones that benefited from the island's transformation. Hema'e became a model for volcanic disaster response, and countries like Japan and Italy facing similar threats would reference their response. Scientists also used data from Eldfell to refine lava cooling techniques, which are still in use by emergency planners and response teams today. Now, this unexpected victory made one question stand out. Why did it work here when similar attempts had failed elsewhere? Well, a key reason was the extreme temperature difference. Lava at around 1100 degrees Celsius met seawater barely above freezing. That sudden contrast caused the lava's surface to solidify quickly. A tough, glassy crust started to form, sometimes reaching up to 15 meters thick. This crust acted like armor. It stopped the lava's advance and forced new lava flows to spread sideways instead of moving forward. Another crucial factor was scale. They ended up pumping more than 6 million cubic meters of seawater straight onto the lava front. That's basically the same as 2,000 Olympic swimming pools. And to make that happen, the pipe system had to stretch even farther than the island itself. At full speed, it was moving enough water to drain a whole medium-sized lake in under three days. 
Keeping that kind of setup running wasn't easy either. The system consumed massive amounts of energy and required constant generator support to keep running day and night. Some even said it's around 20 megawatts of electricity. Without all of that nonstop effort, the lava probably would have reached the harbor and shut it down completely. Timing also played a huge role. Eldfell's lava moved slower than what's typical in Iceland, which gave responders some extra time to act. In total, the eruption released around 0.25 cubic kilometers of lava, not a massive amount by Icelandic standards. The Lakhi eruption in 1783, for example, produced over 10 times that much. But for the people living on Hema'e, Eldfell brought more than enough chaos. Let's also note that the weather helped, too. For most of the eruption, the wind blew the volcano's toxic gas away from the town instead of across it. No one planned that, but it made a big difference for the island as well. The whole operation ended up costing around $2.2 million back then, but it was worth it. If the harbor suffered, the island's economy and future would have suffered as well. Rebuilding started after the eruption. Islanders used the heat that was left in the cooling lava to generate electricity and heat water for homes. Things like tephra, which is volcanic ash and debris from the eruption, were reused to extend the airport. It also served as a landfill for new construction. 200 new homes were built on this solid ground. You could say they rose from the ashes. With time, Hema A didn't just recover, it thrived. Tourists came in growing numbers to see the Pompeii of the North, where lava-choked houses stood frozen in time. Children played on black sand beaches that hadn't existed before 1973, and the fishing industry returned stronger than ever, too. All in all, the Hema A eruption wasn't just a disaster, it was kind of a test of will. When Mother Nature had thrown her worst at them, they threw back the ocean. What do you think about the way the residents of Hema'e saved their town? Leave your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to hit like and the subscribe button for more updates like these.